What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Burton here at Datadash and today is September 16th of 2017. So I've been getting a multitude of requests on my channel to cover a specific ICO that's going to be a first of its kind. In the space of South Korea, we know that there's a lot of money flowing into crypto. And this ICO is going to be the first in South Korea. It's no other than the Icon ICO. I've been looking into this over the past few days, and each day I look into it, the more I learn about it, the more I get excited about the project. It's an enterprise solution I see that's going to be implementing blockchain for a variety of different industries. And quite frankly, how it does everything that it does on its framework and its technology really excites me. And I got to say, as someone who's usually very optimistic, specifically on NEO, Ethereum, and Quantum, Icon is going to give them a run for their money, most likely. And we can already see it in the sense of adoption that they have before they've even launched their ICO. There's already companies utilizing the technology behind it, as we'll talk a little bit about later. And we'll really learn about how Icon makes itself stand out. So again, I get very excited kind of about these enterprise solution ICOs, but I want to be fair and honest and critical and talk about what it's all about, what makes it stand out, but also maybe some flaws behind it. So let's go ahead, talk about Icon, and look into the website to learn a little more about the tech, the team, and the long-term objectives. First off, before I do scroll down though, the ICO is going to be launching, in, uh, or at least the pre-sale for the ICO is going to be launching on September, September 20th, so in about three days. And then we can also see that they've got some solid media coverage, Forbes, CryptoCoins News, Coindesk, Bloomberg. I mean, this is a lot of good coverage, so expect to uh, continue to talk about it in the next few days. So what is Icon objectively trying to do? Well, generally speaking, it's trying to hyperconnect the world. What does that exactly mean though? Well, if you want a good understanding of it, you can go ahead and watch this video, but I'm going to give you a kind of brief framework of understanding how Icon really does this and what makes it stand out against enterprise solution ICOs that have already launched. So again, if you want to pause the video, you can pause it now and watch this one. I think they did a great job on it, but I'm going to go ahead and scroll down and really kind of talk about the Icon network. So the Icon network uh, utilizes a multitude of sub-blockchains that are on the Icon network. And what's really nice about that is they'll be able to communicate with one another. Now, what exactly does that mean? Well, in the world of, you know, kind of building an enterprise solution, you need something that can not only allow uh, a variety of industries to use blockchain. So, for example, you can see e-commerce banks, securities, universities, insurances, and hospitals. Anything you can think of really on the blockchain, but those really cover a lot of the ballpark. Having an area where they can also build, they can build decentralized apps and uh, also communicate and send information between one another, but also communicate with other blockchains on the Icon network. So this is really the game changer that Icon offers. Basically, there's going to be sub blockchains that need to communicate with one another from time to time. Not only communicate within those blockchains between users inside of them. So, for example, we might have an insurance blockchain, one for healthcare, one for universities, etc. And along with that, being able to communicate information and data and services between those different blockchains. That's where the game has changed with Icon, and it is a very powerful concept. And they'll be doing this using a lot of the features that Icon offers. So before I continue going into it, I really want to make sure you get a visualization of what it might look like. So we can see here that through the use of smart contracts, individuals can communicate through uh, the ICON framework. And this is really the one I, I, I want to mention about how you can see an insurance company that might be on a separate blockchain communicating with the hospital. You can also, you could really think about a variety of different situations. I could give you one right off the bat. For example, anytime I go see my doctor, if I go to the hospital, I usually need to bring uh, some form of verification for insurance. Well, if they can communicate through the, the separate blockchains, if they're utilizing blockchain technology, they can communicate with my insurance company. They can send it back information, back and forth, and really make sure and verify my identity and make sure that I have an insurance policy with that provider, check everything off, and I can go about seeing my doctor and getting the healthcare information that I need. So there's a variety of uses, and if this really interests you, you should go ahead and read up on the white paper. The white paper is fantastic. They have a lot of good visualizations that talk about this, and this is a good way of kind of visualizing the different kind of industries being on their own sub-blockchains and using smart contracts to communicate alongside one another. So it's a very, very interesting concept. Um, now, there's a lot of different use cases and a lot of features that come inside the framework that really help it flourish as a, a kind of a foundation for institutional adoption of blockchain technology. First off, I, what I really like is the blockchain ID. Uh, the blockchain ID is basically, a, uh, it's used through smart contracts, but basically allows uh, for different communities to verify identities for individuals. So 
Let's say, for example, that I, in the same situation we were talking about, if I need to verify my ID to a healthcare provider, they can communicate on the uh, network of sub blockchains, they can communicate with the insurance provider and verify my identity. And over time, you'll build up your ID on the blockchain, you'll build up verification, and different communities will easily be able to get the information they need so long as you provide it to them, and if you want to start utilizing the features inside of those communities. so. Very powerful, really interesting, and I like the idea of receive student discounts without showing physical student IDs. So they can see, you know, who you are, you know, who like where you are uh, in the sense of your education on the block, maybe on the education blockchain, and then communicate that to the benefits of other blockchains by verifying your ID on that network. So building your digital identity, something very important for enterprise solution to really come to the blockchain. And they're making it so it's flexible, so the people who do use this, who do use these technologies, will be easily communicative with other people, uh, other different organizations and industries on that blockchain. We also have a decentralized exchange, so you can transfer, settle, and exchange currencies in real time through the decentralized exchange on the Icon Foundation, uh, and outside the Icon Network. So. This is very powerful in the use of integration for banks, securities, insurance, universities, and a variety of other industries to really utilize the Icon Foundation. So again, very nice selling point. I can see why they have it right at the top. And then usability as well. They use something known as the uh, as DaVinci, which is a form of artificial intelligence. And it supposedly is helping in the sense of usability. I think that's good that they have artificial intelligence built in from the get-go because most enterprise solutions, as we'll see when we go down to the comparison chart, do not support uh, artificial intelligence use on blockchain. So something that's very necessary to run effectively. And also the scalability of it. You can connect with traditional blockchains. You can do it with a Bitcoin and Ethereum blockchain and a variety of other third party ones as well. So it's really kind of doing the whole kind of smart economy approach, bringing the real world to the digital blockchain economy. So. To me, it's a cool concept, and I, I think that it will continue to expand, especially off the fact that it's decentralized. So really trying to bring enterprise in a smart way, making sure it's ease of use, there's a sense of governance, there's a sense of communities, but at the same time, it's decentralized. It's not one singular institution. So that's really, I think, what they're, what's really going to make them stand out is the, the ease of use and connectivity between different communities. So we have a comparison of blockchains here. If you really want to get an idea, for example, Ethereum, EOS, and Bancor are listed here alongside Icon. Icon is run on a platform known as the Loop Chain, um, and you'll learn that that's pretty much how uh, the different kind of communities communicate with one another. Uh, you can build decentralized apps on it. There's interchain um, communications, real-time transactions, and also the decentralized exchange. There's a decentralized decision-making process as well, a consensus algorithm. Uh, smart contract ver uh, versioning, multi-channel, tiered system, and AI support. I think the AI support is going to be a big selling point uh, over time. As you can see that no other, I mean this goes with multi-channel as well, and tiered system and smart contract versioning, but quite frankly I think AI support is really a big selling point. Um, and I think it'll be important for blockchain to work effectively in the future. So we have a good roadmap here. You can see that they're uh, having, they're hoping by quarter three of 2017 to have the first open source of Loop Chain, first developers meetup, and then partnership with Major Bank. Uh, they've actually, I think, recently just signed on with um, either it was a it was a big bank or big finance agreement, but they've actually been working with a few partnering banks right now uh, at universities. Uh, I think insurance and health providers as well, as we'll look a little bit later. I have the numbers on the ICO review, but definitely already building a sense of adoption early on before the ICO is even launched. So, uh, our, yeah, I'm sorry, I guess this is quarter three of 2017. So that now we're looking towards quarter four. They have the ICO, the listing of ICX, um, which is the icon, uh, the, the currency for the icon foundation. And you can see they just have a lot of different things objectively set, and pretty soon as well. So I think that this is good. They have a nice roadmap you can read into. Once you read the white paper, this will be a little more understanding. But you can see they also have goals for adoption as well. 10 universities, I think that's good. Uh, and it will be cool to see you know, blockchain come to education as well. And they've got a little information on the token sale. About 50% is going to be distributed towards um, average investors like you and I who might want to be participants in the ICO. And they're targeting to raise 150,000 Ether. So in total, have a valuation from the ICO of 300,000 Ether. So, and you'll get uh, uh, 2,500 from ICX for one Ether as well. And you can see the distribution here. And as we scroll down, there's some key dates as well. The mainnet launch will come in quarter four of 2017. 
And for now, I want to let you all know before we jump to the team, it is a private, um, it's private right now. So uh, it's not something that's exactly public on the blockchain. So I think they wanted to start off private at first to get corporate adoption on it. And then eventually they're talking about moving private. And I'll mention where you can find a little information on that as well as we go. All right. So we've been talking a lot about Icon, but I got to tell you all, nothing is more shocking than the team. Uh, I am not seeing any blockchain project. And I'm talking even on the likes of like Arc and Neo and a lot of other ones that I'm really optimistic on have such a large scale team. And some of these are A plus players, folks. So you can go through, they mentioned their advisors first and foremost. They have seven advisors on the team as you scroll through. The Foundation Council has over five individuals. We're gonna learn a little bit about Min Kim in a little bit uh, and one of the interviews he did. You have the Foundation Council. Uh, he has a lot of experience as well behind him. And then we have the blockchain department, an entire department dedicated to blockchain, which has, oh, how much is that? Sorry, it was uh, 12, 12, 13, 14, 15, 15 people on the blockchain department, AI department, just solely focused on AI, one, two, three, four, five people who are working on that. And design and marketing has over five individuals as well. This is a fully scaled team, folks. And I mean, we could, spend all day trying to dive through into each one of these individuals, but they late have a nice sense of description behind them. I read through a few of them. I really want to focus on Men Kim because he did an interview, a really nice interview with um, uh, this really nice uh, girl who does, I think, a lot of interviews with ICOs, but he answered things more honestly than I've ever seen someone who's working on an ICO project. He's clear, understandable about what they're objectively trying to do. And this is a great interview with Min Kim himself. He talks a little bit about his previous experience in fintech. Um, he's done work in the United States and in South Korea in the financial sector, and actually was a part of building one of the largest fintech companies out in South Korea. So definitely interesting. I recommend you go watch the interview. I'll leave a link down below in the description. This is a little bit of the company that he worked on called Daily Financial Group. So you can look into that as well. I don't want to dive too much into it per se, but there is a lot of experienced people on this team. So definitely keep your eye on it. Definitely uh, read through some of the team members and learn a little bit about what they're objectively all about, what they've done in their past. And of course, at the bottom, what's nice is I know I can't answer every question. So if you wanna read the FAQ, there it is for you. You can go through and dive through it. And I recommend as always, I always recommend, read the white paper. It's a little chunky, 39 pages, but it's worth it if you're gonna invest in it. So let's go ahead towards the ICO review. As I said, I'm going to try and start doing this on my ICOs, my channel, but the main objective here, let's just recap. The icon project is building one of the largest decentralized networks in the world. It does this through building a framework that links various blockchains to the icon network. It's aiming to become the largest enterprise solution for blockchain. So the big selling points that I see in the ICO as a whole, First and foremost, I think what you all realized when you saw it was, holy crap, this is the first ICO in South Korea where big money has been flowing into crypto. I think that no matter where you stand, I understand that blockchain can be decentralized. You can choose whatever option works best for you. I mean, we've been seeing South Korea has invested in Ethereum and Ripple and all these other crypto uh, blockchain-based technologies. But the fact that it's South Korea's first ICO is a pretty big selling point, uh, at least at its launch. Second, uh, they're aiming to break the barrier of blockchains communicating. We talked about how powerful this could be and how necessary it is for enterprise solution to really thrive for um, you know, long-term adoption of the blockchain. We also have a functioning product at hand. They actually have technology that's being adopted. And as we look through it, these are the numbers that I wanted to read to you all. They have over 25 securities firms, 25 already. They haven't even launched their ICO. Six hospitals, three universities, a few banks, and uh, I think they were talking, uh, there was one big, I, I didn't mention there, I have an and there. You can look through the, the, and the interview they mentioned about, they just signed on some big partnership. But again, just a lot of different kind of sectors and industries that are being adopted. The second thing, or not the second thing, the next thing I want to talk about is enterprise. So, I mean, like I said, this is focusing on a variety of industries, and you can already see it up here. They're already proving it through the sense of adoption, but you can do anything, securities, finance, healthcare, remittance, a big thing that's been coming into the crypto space, uh, technology, real estate, etc. 
They also have an open source GitHub, as you can see right here. I will also leave that down in a link uh, in the description below. You should check out their GitHub, see if you feel comfortable about it as a developer, if you are a developer in the, the uh, in kind of coding space. Um, they've also got funding by the Korean government. With all the scare in Asian markets, especially in China, about governments cracking down on ICOs, seeing as it's all happening mostly in the eastern part of the world, South Korea is kind of a beacon of light. Uh, they're really more focused right now, if you learn from the Min Kim interview, um, they're really more focused on exchanges and regulating exchanges first and foremost. South Korea has already had a decent amount of turmoil from its past president, and they're still trying to correct that. So they really haven't defined any regulation around ICOs. So the space is very open, uh, and what's nice is they've got support from the Korean government. So if you're looking for an ICO or a candidate that's safe to invest in, I'm pretty sure if the Korean government's been investing in it, then you're a lot more safer uh, in the long term with this bet. And the last one I want to talk about is the more active a community it is, the more uh, a, a community in general is, or the more you're active with a community, the more flexibility and benefit you get on the platform. So it encourages usability and it encourages bringing people onto the platform and it really building a sense of community. Now, there are a few worries and fears with this. With the, you know, the benefit of more activity in the community and more flexibility being given to those individuals who are more active, there is some centralization. And the reason why there's benefit to it originally is because uh, for different types of funding, raising, you know, ICOs on the blockchain for ICON, uh, all kinds of things that you know, are dependent and functional on there, uh, you get a lot more benefit um, from the actual kind of governance system that they have overall in the Icon Foundation. And it's only temporary though, to be fair. Uh, this is going to kind of go away over time, but early on, they're kind of acting as a, a kind of helping hand to really get a start on the blockchain and set some ground rules at the beginning. And getting with that, as we're saying, you know, early on and stuff, technology for the Icon Foundation is still very early on. We see corporate ado partners adopting it, so they see the use in it. But even um, Min Kim in the interview said that, quite frankly, you know, we are still kind of on the dial-up uh, kind of phase of the technology for blockchain. Not everything is potentially able to be brought over to the blockchain. It's just not that scalable yet. Um, but over time, the Icon Foundation aims to do that. I mean, with the team they have, I really think that they could reach it. But again, it's more of a long-term objective. We're seeing the long-term potential of blockchain. We haven't seen mass scale adoption yet. And the reason why we're investing in it is because we want to look at the long-term. But again, that is a very decent criticism. And the last one I want to really bring up is the competition. There is a lot of other enterprise solution competition out there. There's Ethereum, Neo, Quantum, and so many more in the space. So you really have to decide by reading the white paper and really understanding it and watching all the resources and interviews that you can around the project, if it's better than those, can it beat them out? Ethereum has been in development for quite some time. Neo's got a pretty sizable team, same as Quantum, and they've both got a sense of adoption and have already had launched ICOs for a few months now. In Neo's case, a few years, and Ethereum as well. You know, can't really catch up to it. Well, I will say that the project's been in works for the past two years, but they're just launching the ICO, so they might still be a little bit behind. So, Last thing I want to talk about is the token's value as the platform. Basically, as I said before, uh, the value of the token increases as the platform is adopted. So it's used for a variety of things, such as transactions, running securities on the ICON uh, network. Uh, they said something even as frivolous as, you know, for real estate, etc. It really can be used for anything. So read through the white paper, definitely get a better understanding of it, everyone. I really think that the ICON project could be big, but at the same time, folks, I mean, whether or not this uh, has a successful ICO, the enterprise solution market for cryptocurrency and blockchain is really interesting. It's going to be hard. It's going to be very competitive. I don't want to be completely exuberant on it. And I think even Min Kim in the interview was just kind of level-headed about it. He said, you know, we're still very early on. We're staying humble in it. And hopefully in the long term, Icon can be one of those leaders. But as someone who's invested in Neo and Ethereum, I will say Icon's going to give, Icon's going to give them a run for their money. So... Keep an eye on it. Hopefully, if you find it to be interesting, you might participate in the ICO. Uh, I'm definitely considering it myself, so long as all the legal ramifications are fine that I can invest in it. But until then, everyone, I'd like to hear what you all think in the comments down below. Get a discussion going, talking about it. Love to hear what you all think in the comments down below. If there's a coin or token, an ICO that you'd want me to cover on this channel, please let me know in the comments below. But until then, everyone, I will see you all in the next video. Stay tuned. Thank <laughs> you.